mathematics and uh, sh she is working on uh, many interesting structures uh, which are uh, which lies on the boundary of uh, algebraic number theory as well as uh, the group theory and particularly there are few aspects which fall in representation theory am i right maria yeah something related to representation theory so yeah. over to over to mariam to explain us what is moonshine and arithmetic uh, the word moonshine has many different meanings so i would <laughs> i would request you to please explain the moonshine word first to the audience and then move forward yeah. and don't over to, over to experts right sorry could you say that again yeah please over to you mariam oh. i've started now <laughs> okay, so can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that very lovely introduction. And also just thank you for having me here. I am really excited to be uh, back at LUMS uh, giving a talk. So the title of my talk today is Moonshine and Arithmetic. Um, and as Dr. Imran said, I am going to start by telling you about what Moonshine is. Okay, so this is the plan for my talk. Um, and so the talk is going to be in two separate parts. The first half is just going to be about the story of Moonshine. Um, so I'm going to uh, spend a bunch of time here in Monstrous Moonshine. I'm going to give you the original example of Moonshine. Um, then I will uh, give you a couple other examples, including an example that um, first appeared in my PhD thesis. Um, then I will, the second half of this talk is going to be using Moonshine to say stuff about uh, number theory, number theoretic objects. Um, okay, so uh, that part is again part of my dissertation and um, I will get to it when I get to it. I do also want to say um, I don't know how these seminars are normally run, uh, but I like a lot of audience interaction, so please ask me questions. Um, I will probably ask you questions, so please pay attention. <laughs> um, okay, so let's begin. Let's start why, with, the theory, uh, with the story of Moonshine. The, so the story of Moonshine really begins at the classification of finite simple groups. Okay, so finite groups, hopefully you're all familiar with. Finite groups we all like and we think they're cool and we wanna study them. Um, finite simple groups are basically what, you know, elements are to molecules. So finite simple groups to finite groups is the same thing as like atoms to molecules. Um, so in order to study all finite groups, you might want to start by studying uh, all finite simple groups. And again, in order to study something, one way of doing that is to classify them and then study the uh, category separately. So like write a periodic table. So uh, the mathematician's version or a group theorist's version of a periodic table is this classification that took actually a really long time for um, mathematicians to figure out. Um, and it's considered one of the greatest achievements of 20th century math. It is called the classification of finite simple groups. And it is a very clean, nice theorem that says the following. It says that all finite simple groups, almost all finite simple groups, fit neatly into three infinite families. Um, cyclic groups, alternating groups, and finite groups of Lie type. There are 26 exceptions to this rule. There are 26 groups that don't fit into any of these families, and so they're like inherently interesting. Um, these are called the sporadic simple groups, and uh, the, there are 26 of them. And here is a picture that I stole from Wikipedia, basically. This is a Wikipedia picture of the sporadic simple groups. Um, the, the nodes are groups and then the lines are sub quotient structure. Okay, so the one that we're going to talk about, the one that we're most interested in is this, the, is this one on the top. It is called the monster group. Um, the monster group is the largest of the sporadic simple groups um, and it has this order. So the order of the monster group is two to the 46 times three to the 20. I'm not gonna read out this whole number, um, but it is this large number, uh, which is about eight times 10 to the 53 um, in scientific notation, I guess. Um, the monster group was first conjectured to exist in 1973. 
And then uh, it was first constructed in 1981. So there was a while between the first conjecture of the monster group and the first construction. I'm not gonna give you many dates in this, um, in this talk, but 1981 is interesting because later I will talk more about that. Um, Okay, in the meantime, between 1973 and 81, we had a conjecture that such a group exists. And based on that conjecture, Conway and Norton, Conway of this seminar's title, uh, that Conway, they uh, conjectured that the smallest non-trivial irreducible representation of the monster group is 19683 dimensional. If you don't know what that means, I will tell you what a representation is in just a second. Um, so Conway and Norton conjectured that the smallest non-trivial irreducible representation is 19683 dimensional and Fisher, Livingstone and Thorne computed a character table of the monster based on this assumption. Okay. Um, so, uh, excuse me, yes. uh, Mariam. So this is the largest known finite simple group, right? Is this the largest known finite simple group? No, it's not. Um, so for example, you can find here's, that's a good question. Um, remember that SN is uh, the order of SN, the symmetric group on N things is just um, N factorial. So you can make arbitrary large finite simple group, finite groups um, as you want. Um, is it the largest known finite simple group? I also do not think so because cyclic groups are simple. So like any Z mod N Z is simple. So pick oh, N to be particularly this particularly one. this is regarding to sporadic. Yes, group. this is yeah. the largest okay. Okay, okay. sporadic simple group. Um, okay. And that is interesting. That in particular is interesting because it is a weirdly large number, like eight times 10 to the 53 is a weirdly large number, but then they stop like, so they go from like, uh, you know, a small number. Uh, so, so it is weird that they uh, that there are 26 groups that don't fit into the story. And then the largest one is this like strange large number. So yeah, so the monster group is mysterious. That is a, that is a completely fair um, thing to ask. Okay, so great. So um, let me take a detour and just give you a quick spiel on what a representation is and what a character table even is. Character table of the monster group is again, gonna be interesting in the story. So I want to spend some time here. If you already know what a character is, you know, just bear with me for a second. Um, so here's how we define the representation of a finite group. I'm going to let V be a finite dimensional vector space over C. And then a linear representation of a finite group is just a homomorphism from G to GLV. GLV is the um, general linear group of V, by which I mean these are maps from V to itself that are invertible. So if this is your first time looking at this definition, here's a simple example of a representation. Um, you can take any element of G and you can map it to the identity map. So by identity map, I mean the map that maps any element of V to itself. So we, I'm basically taking elements of G and looking at them as maps of this vector space. Um, if you like the uh, uh, the language of actions of a finite group, then this is an action of the finite group on the vector space V. Okay, if I pick a represent, if I pick a um, basis for V, so V is just an n-dimensional vector space, I can pick any basis, then I actually get a matrix representation of G. So for the trivial, not the trivial, for the um, representation that I said, where you just map G to the identity map, uh, a matrix representation would just be map G to the identity matrix, the N by N identity matrix, where N is the dimension of this vector space. Okay, um, so that's what our representation is. Um, and here's my first example of this talk. Uh, I am not going to give you the answer, but if you get bored of listening to me talk, you should try to find all one dimensional representations of C4, where C4 is um, the group of, on four elements, cyclic group on four elements. So this, uh, you might have also seen it as Z mod 4Z or something. Okay, so pausing here to see if there are any questions or concerns. Okay, um, if not, so let's also, so here's one main theorem of representation theory, which says that every finite dimensional representation of a finite group's G over C 
is either irreducible or decomposable into irreducible representations. So by irreducible representation, I mean that each of these, the only non-trivial sub-representations of these are, are zero and w, w itself. And then I can pick any representation and I can write it as a direct sum of irreducible representations. So maybe it is useful to just look at irreducible representations of, 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 of a, a finite group. Here's another invariant that I need to define. The character of a representation is the function chi from G to C, which is given by chi of G is just the trace of this matrix rho of G. Remember that trace of a matrix is invariant under base change. So it is independent of basis. So whatever basis you picked for your vector space, the trace is an invariant of the vector space. And also it is a class function, by which I mean that is co constant on conjugacy classes of the group. So remember that conjugacy classes, the conjugacy class of H is all elements that are of the form G, H, G inverse or G inverse H, G. And since the trace is invariant in your basis, trace of G, H, G inverse is actually just equal to trace of H. Um, so this is from linear algebra. And this means that trace is a, our character is a is a is an invariant of this representation. Okay, so now I'm ready to define what a character table is. So the character table of G is a table with entries chi i g j, where so chi i rows and g j is our columns, where g j are the conjugacy classes, and chi i's are the irreducible representations of G. So here is my second example. Um, so if you if you did the first example, you have possibly four representations of C4. And I'm gonna uh, now give you the answer for the first example. So here's how you fill in a character table. So chi one is the first irreducible representation. One possibility for a representation is just, you know, map X2, the identity map. Okay, so what are the other irreducible representations, one-dimensional irreducible representations of C4. Let's see, so what does that even mean? So if I want to compute G goes to GL1C, so one by one invertible matrices on the complex numbers. So what are one by one invertible matrices on the complex numbers? These are just complex numbers but uh, not zero because that's not an invertible matrix, right? So, so that's what the representations of C4 are. Um, so I need to find a number uh, to map X to. What number should I map it to? What are my possibilities? Remember that X to the four is one. So now my question to you guys is, can you tell me four numbers in four complex numbers, not zero, not including zero, such that if you take their fourth power, you get one. Plus minus one plus minus iota. Good, okay, so plus minus i plus minus one. So I can map x to one minus one, i minus i, right? And then, you know, I can figure out what happens to x squared and x cubed just by that. So if I take the square of one, I get one. If I take the cube of one, I get one. Minus one squared is one and so on. You can fill in the rest of this table. Very good. So this is what a character table is. So great. Now you can ask, I just talked, I just told you what the one dimensional representations are. Why haven't I filled out like the two dimensional, four dimensional, so on representations? Well, here's the other theorem which says the character tables are square. So actually, as soon as I found four, I know that those are all of them. So actually C4 only has one dimensional representations. This is a general theorem that CN only has one dimensional irreducible representations. But anyway, so character tables are square. So here, finally, now that you know what a character table is, is the character table of the monster group. So here. So first disclaimer, the character table of the monster group was not going to fit on my slides. It's a really large group. It actually has 194 columns and 194 rows. So this is this goes on in both directions. So there's more rows and more columns. I, I'm just looking at the top left corner. OK, and I will come back to we will we will stare at this table again. So for now, it's just some numbers in front of you. 
Um, but at this point, I'm going to take a detour in the story. I've just, uh, so consider this as like a, 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 a movie where the two main characters are eventually gonna meet. So I've told you some background in the first main character, which is the monster group. My other um, main character is, um, is the J function. So I'm not now going to take some time to tell you about the J function. Excuse me, may I have a question? Yes, please. Okay, so uh, you define the character table uh, by by the conjugacy classes, and mm -hmm. in your example, this I, I guess there is only just one conjugacy classes. Therefore, we have just one uh, character table. Is the character table always unique? The character Do table is unique. Conjugacy yes. Classes? Yes. But how how you can define because there are different conjugacy classes in the group. It can happen. Um. I am not sure I completely understood your question. There are only, these are the four conjugacy classes of C4. So those are them. Uh, One so F, for example. Them. Yes. Uh, okay. But that's the conjugacy classes in this case are very, very trivial, just containing one element. Each conjugacy class can be- Yes, just very one good. Element. Yeah, so, great. Yeah. So. So I'm I'm thinking. Uh, suppose we have a group. We have uh, non-trivial conjugacy classes, more than one element. What would be the character table in that case? Yeah. So uh, so good. I I think I understand your question. You're asking if there was a mm -hmm. if this conjugacy class had a different representative, would I get the same character table? And that is this mm -hmm. thing that I said before. Let me go back um, to this. So remember when I said that um, characters are class functions? So characters are, are character values don't change if you take a different representation data of your conjugacy class. So you can label your conjugacy class however you want, but the, the actual values don't change. So that's this fact that, that your character is a class function. Does that okay, answer? So this means that every group has a, has a unique character table. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. Yeah, so if you want like more details on why this is a class function, I'm just gonna refer you back to the fact that trace of A, B, A inverse is just trace of B. So remember from like linear algebra, determinants behave very nicely. Determinant of A, B is just determinant of A and determinant of B, but this is not true for the trace, but it behaves like almost very nicely. It behaves like this. So that's why, so this is just conjugates. So conjugate, on conjugates, character tables, characters values are the same. All right, other questions, comments, thoughts, worries, screams of agony. Okay, um, so let's now take a different route and look at the J function. Um, so I'm gonna start by defining what a modular function is. The J function is a modular function. So the group SL2Z, which is defined to be two by two matrices, A, B, C, D, where A, D minus B, C is one, um, where these are all in A, D, B, and C are all integers, acts on the upper half plane H, which is this, this stuff, which is tau in complex numbers, such as imaginary of tau is positive. So like literally the upper half plane, literally the stuff whose imaginary part is positive. If you look at complex plane as like, as the plane. Um, by tau goes to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. So again, if you get bored in my talk and you want another exercise, check this. Check that if I act on tau, so if I start by something that is in the upper half plane and I uh, land, at a tau plus b over c tau plus d, and I have this condition that a d minus b c is one, then this also lands in upper half plane. So it's imaginary part is also positive. Okay, so a modular function is just of level one, is just a function that is invariant under this action. Um, and I need some growth condition in order for this function to like not be too crazy. So, so this is kind of like saying, I want my function to be meromorphic, but don't worry too much about the growth condition. A modular function is just a function that is invariant under this action. 
And the J function, the elliptic modular invariant, is the simplest non-constant modular form in the sense that every other modular function is actually just a rational function in J. But the point here is that the J function has what we call a Q series, a Fourier series. So let me explain what this is. So notice that by definition, the um, element 1101 1, 1 lives in SL2Z. So first, do we agree with this? Well, clearly one times one minus zero times one is one. So it's traced as one. If one one zero one lives in SL two Z, then I want to know what the action of that is on tau. Well, the action is just tau plus one over one, which is tau plus one. So the J function is actually invariant under tau, periodic, um, periodic in tau. And if I define Q to be e to the two pi i tau, then this fact just means that I have a Fourier series, j tau equals q to the negative one plus so on. Okay, so now is time for our two heroes to meet. I am going to write down on the same slide the Fourier series of the j function and the character table of the monster group. And I am going to pause here and I'm going to let you just look at the, the slide, meditate on the slide, tell me if you have if you notice something, any any thoughts that come to mind are welcome. I didn't pick that uh, the power of Q, how the things are moving. So where is the constant term? Oh, the constant term is just zero in this case. For, for the J function, it is zero. Uh, okay. Can you explain a little bit about uh, how this uh, these coefficients are appearing here? Um, How do you write a Q series? Yeah, okay. So, so notice again that, um, do you agree that 1101 one, one is an SL2Z? And by that, I mean that J of tau plus J of tau, J of tau is equal to J of tau plus one. Do you agree with this? Okay. Okay, so if something is invariant under tau and tau is in the upper half plane, um, basically what I'm saying is that you can write a Q series for something that is that behaves this way. So I haven't told you how to get these coefficients. I'm mm -hmm. going to find a page here. Here's my page. Um, but here, here's a quick explanation. So the upper half plane maps to um, the upper half plane maps to the punctured disk D. Um, by tau goes to e, e, e to, to the two pi tau, i tau, right? And then my functions, if I take a modular function, modular functions are functions from H to C, okay? And now I'm saying there is a unique way of writing your modular function as uh, a function of Q instead of tau, where Q is this. Instead of writing your modular function as F of tau, I can write it as F of Q. Okay, now in terms of Q, it is an analytic, not an analytic, a uh, meromorphic function, not holomorphic, but meromorphic. And for meromorphic functions in complex plane, you can write their Fourier expansions. You can write, you know, if, if I have a function in terms of Q, I can always write CN Q to the N. Um, mm -hmm. Where N can be, you know, negative infinity to positive infinity, but I really want it to be greater than like some number. So that's why I added the condition that like my function grows at most exponentially. So I, so I want these to be Laurent series. Um, now, what are the CNs? Well, they will differ with, with each F and I haven't told you and actually won't tell you how to find them for the, for the J function, but this is just a, it is well known thing that those are the, um, the coefficients for the J function. Does that answer your question? Does that at least? Okay, okay. Uh, so these are just for you. These are just so it's the same thing as like you write the sine function as as its Fourier series. You write you know three factorial and five factorial. So in a similar way, you can find where one nine six eight four comes from or two one four. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Great, so again, I'm going to pause here again on this slide. I really want people to make some conjectures. Tell me 
what they think is happening here. Are there any thoughts that come up are welcome at this point? Please, you know, unmute yourself and answer or put in the chat. Like, um, I'm happy to read the chat as well. So, so the coefficient of Q is somehow, uh, so the, the first, uh, the first number, second number, I guess. So this yeah. is some, some. Who's talking? Sina, please say. Nakib. So I'm Nakib. So okay. the, the, the coefficient of Q is somehow similar, almost just the difference of one. Yes. Very good. Okay. Perfect. So that is a very And good uh, maybe. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. Other, there are other connections. I don't know. Oh, there is said, other. You said maybe. So you have another thought. Please tell me the other Let's thought. Okay. I have no other thought. Uh, the the only link uh, we can see here is that uh, here the coefficient of Q is almost uh, is from the difference of one uh, in the character table in the, in the very, first very column good. of the character table. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir, very much. There's also someone who posted in the chat. Very good. So this is uh, an audience full of John Mackay's. So yes, this is exactly right. Um, the let's see. Let me find a highlighter that will show up. So this number of these two, it does show up. Okay. One nine six eight eight three plus one is one nine six eight eight four which is this number. Very good. So this is exactly what happened to John Mackay in 1970s. He was working with the monster group. Again, it, the monster group is not yet, um, we don't yet know if it exists in 1970s. He was working with this character table and he was like, oh, this number looks very much like this other number that I know. And the other number is the coefficient of the J function. He told this to John Thompson and John Thompson uh, noticed the, this other thing, which I was hoping that someone here will point out, is that if you actually add this number, the first three numbers together, so anyone who is like very quick at arithmetic, if you add these three numbers together, you actually get this number. Okay. Very good. Good. Great. Um, that is a very good observation. And if you were me, you would now be like, oh my God, what if the third number is, is the same as the sum of the first four? So let's add these four together and maybe this keeps going and we have found a pattern. Well, that fails. That Okay, the re, the I'm not going to do the maths here, but I'm just going to do it mod 10. So look at it. Um, just look at 1366. 6 plus 6 is 12, plus 3 is 15, plus 1 is 16. So you should get a 6 but you get a zero, so that already feels. Again, if you were me, you would be like, all right, well, I give up. This was obviously a coincidence, let's go home, right? But John Thompson said, well, actually, okay, they don't add up exactly like this, but they might add up if I like fudge them a little bit. So if you actually look at, let's see, um, two times one plus two times the second number, plus one times the third number and one times the fourth number, and you add these together, you actually get this number. So again, I'm not gonna do the arithmetic, but look at it now, again, mod 10. You get six plus six, 12, plus six, which is 18, plus two, which is 20, so you get a zero. So at least it works, mod 10. Um, okay, so do the arithmetic. It actually turns out to be this number. And now there is hope that there is like more going on. But at this point, I'm going to consider the fact that I'm only looking at the first column of the character table, but the character table is really rich. It has other columns as well. So now let's look at other columns of the character table. So let's look at 2B. You can also do this with 2A, but I thought that you might think that I'm cheating if I'm just looking at the first two. So I'm just gonna pick out another random one. So let's look at 2B and do the following. I'm going to start writing down a function that I'm going to call T2B of tau. And I'm just going to use the J function as like a formula for T2B. So the J function is Q to the minus one plus something times Q where the something is remember the, the sum of the first two entries. So I'm just now going to artificially like add the first two entries here and make this 276, okay? Then something times Q squared, which is the sum of the first three entries 
which now the third entry is negative. So you'll actually get negative 2048 plus two times the first entry plus two times the second entry plus one times the third entry plus one times the fourth entry. And please check my math on this. Please actually really check my math on this. I've forgotten what the number is. I think it is one, one, two, or two Q cubed plus order of Q to the four. Okay, so now I've just written down some numbers next to uh, next to some Q, Q, Q series. And you can ask, or is this function that I've written down, T2B, is this an, um, an interesting function by any chance? And actually it is. It is a well-known modular form. It is this one. It's these numbers are actually, actually turn out to be a modular form. If you've taken any classes on modular form, if you've ever like seen anything on a first course in modular forms, delta of tau is kind of the one of the first ones that you uh, learn about. It's it's the smallest cusp form of weight twelve and so on. Um, so T two B is another well known modular form. And now again, if you're a mathematician, you want to generalize. So you can ask, well, what about the other one hundred and ninety two columns? If I start doing this thing with every well, that's exactly what John Thompson conjectured. He said that yes, there's feedback on somebody's mind. Uh, let me let me know. Uh, Buhari. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. It's gone now. Buhari, uh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. This is a lot of noise. Uh, Mariam, please give me the host right. Co host right. Oh, I. I okay, now co continue. Continue. No, you don't have to do Mariam. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Carry on, Mariam. Okay, so so John Thompson at this point had enough information to conjecture this like really scary looking uh, conjecture that I'm going to read out and then explain to you what this is saying. So he conjectured that there exists an infinite dimensional monster module V natural whose graded dimension is J of tau. So he said that there is actually a vector space going on in the background. This is why the monster group and the J function mm -hmm. seem to have the same numbers. Um, that there is an infinite dimensional monster module whose graded dimension is J of tau. And each of its Mackay Thompson series, which, you know, each of its graded traces is a normalized hop module for a genus zero subgroup for SL2R, by, which is a mouthful, but basically is actually a special function in the, in, the, in the world of modular forms. I will come back to talking about what a normalized hop module is, but first I wanna make sure that we like know what this um, theorem is saying. This theorem is just saying there is, it's not just a coincidence that these numbers equal these numbers. It's actually that these, num these two seemingly unrelated objects are connected through a vector space, um, which is a monster module. This conjecture is cool because it was proven. It is now a theorem. It was proven in uh, 1992 by Borchardt, building on work by Conway and Norton and Franco Pasky and Muirman, again, Conway of this seminar's title. Um, and I want to focus just a tiny bit on what a normalized hop module is. I'm not gonna give you a definition. The definition is technical. The point of a normalized hop module is that they are uniquely determined by their invariance groups. So in particular, if for each G in the monster group, I give you the list of gamma Gs. So what is gamma G? It was in the, this is the gamma G. So for each G, if I give you one of these subgroups, then I have basically given you that uniquely determines what the what the uh, TG is and TG the coefficients of TG are just traces of G on this natural module. So in particular, you can compute the structure of V as a monster module without ever doing computations with the monster itself. You, you never have to like look at the monster group. You can just look at these groups that are much smaller, much easier to handle and get these traces out of that. I also want to point out, remember I said, I won't give you a lot of dates, but 1981 is interesting because 1981 was when we had the first um, construction of the monster group. Notice that this conjecture was in 1979, which is before 1981. So 
at the time when he made this conjecture, we didn't even have a proof that the monster group existed. And he's basically saying, um, I can get a bunch of information about this group without ever dealing with this group itself. Like I don't have to look at the elements of the group itself. I just have, I have all of this information. Okay, so that is what we call moonshine. And the reason it is called moonshine historically is because um, when, you know, group theorists were like, these numbers look like these numbers. Um, everyone else in the math world was basically like, you've gone insane, right? So moonshine is a British slang for lunacy. It's, it's British slang for like, this is crazy talk, right? So people were like, this seems insane that these numbers, like you were just doing numerology now, you're not doing number theory anymore. But th that's the cool part of the story is that it is now a theorem. It, this story actually has, a, has an ending. Um, and I want to point out that there, it, the, the most interesting part of the story is this genus zero property of moonshine, which says that each of these Mackay Thompson series is actually just uh, is actually just uh, is just uniquely determined by its behavior at the cusp. So it's a normalized hot module for a genus zero subgroup. I just, I again, don't wanna say what a normalized hot module is except the following, except the fact that even in the world of modular forms, being a normalized hot module is a very rare thing. So if I just, you know, gave you a random list of numbers and I said, form a Q series, is this a modular form? You can bet so much money on it not being a modular form, right? So it is very, very rare that the thing that you, you just looked at some numbers and they turned out to be modular forms. And it's even more rare that you looked at some numbers and they turned out to be normalized hot modules. So the story is wild, is basically my, my conclusion here. Um, and at this point in time, you should ask, well, is this all a coincidence? Is this story just a coincidence? Was the monster group was just special enough and then the J function was maybe special enough and so on. And this is kind of what mathematicians thought for a while after um, monstrous moonshine was proven. Um, so remember that the monster group, I've told you that it is special in the world of finite groups. It is the largest of the ones that don't fit into any of our normal stories. And I've also told you that the normalized hot modules are all special in the world of modular firms. They're rare, they, they, being a normalized hot module is a very special property. I haven't told you anything about the V natural, about VOAs, and I'm not going to because that's just another story that I'm not, I, I don't want to tell you. But you might want to believe me at this point that conjecturally V natural is special in the world of VOAs. So you might at this point think, well, okay, this was just a coincidence. It was just a very special group and a very special function. And they happen to like coincide in this way. And again, that is what people thought uh, for a long time. And I don't, again, with my time, I don't wanna go way too much into um, all the instances of moonshine that we have seen since, but I'm gonna give you one more example. So here's, uh, a paper in uh, 2014 published by John Duncan and Sandra McCrane, and they said the following. They said that there exists an infinite dimensional convex zero module, V supernatural, whose graded dimension is T2B, where T2B is this function, if you remember from before, and whose mackay thompson series is again a normalized hot module for a genus zero subgroup of SL2R. So this looks a lot like what the monster moonshine story looks like. Uh, Conway zero is not actually a um, sporadic simple group, but it is very close to one. Conway one, so Conway zero mod, modded out by its center is just Conway one. So the group is not sporadic, but still like close enough. And then the modular forms are actually just normalized hot modules. And uh, again, it is a theorem in, in their paper as well that their vertex operator algebra is, uh, is special in the world of vertex operator algebras. Okay, so my point is that here is a second example of moonshine. So convent moonshine looks enough like monstrous moonshine that you can be convinced that this is the same phenomenon as we saw before. Okay, Mariam, uh, this uh, uh, Hasse diagram indicates something. What the post-set formulation tha, the map. Uh, just go to the previous slide. 
what does the arrows reflect uh, yeah, lines between the ceo lines or sub quotient structure sub quotient structure yeah so for example the baby monster is um is a subgroup of the monster but not all of these are so convey one is not a subgroup it is a is a quotient so sub quotient means subgroups or quotients or or quotients of subgroups so all sporadic groups um most of them are actually connected to the monster in some way. And then there are uh, like a few of them that are not, which are called pariah groups. Um, so, yeah. And as far as uh, they're all simple groups, right? They're so all none simple. Of, so none of them is a normal one, right? None of them has a normal subgroup. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Awesome. So, at this point, I have maybe, so what have I done so far? I've told you one story, which was Monsters Munchai. I said, maybe it looks like this is a coincidence. And then in order to refute that, I have said, well, there's, here's another story called Conway Munchai, which looks like it should be the, a second example of the same phenomenon. And then once you have two examples, the reason to give you two examples is the following. If two examples exist, you can ask why why not more? Like what? So okay, if all, if you only know one example of some phenomenon, you can very easily be like, okay, maybe this was a coincidence. But once you have two examples, I think that that is very convincing to be like, okay, where are all of the other examples? How do I make a general theory out of this? What is what is actually going on, right? And so the answer is that there are a lot of other examples at this point in time, and this is my list of things to Google. I'm not going to say anything about any of these, but if you want to know more, you should Google Matthew Moonshine, you should Google Umbro Moonshine, read these papers, talk to me after, whatever. And I'm going to, I'm, I've spent a long time giving you background, so now I'm going to pivot and tell you about one other example of Moonshine that actually appears in my work. So, which is called Moonshine for the Thompson Group. At this point, I'm, I'm done with the first half of the talk, which is um, all background. And I will tell you about Moonshine for the Thompson Group. And then I will ask how much time I have. And if you want me to stop, I will stop after that. We don't have to get into applications of Munger theory. Okay, so let TH denote Thompson's group, which is another one of the sporadic simple groups. It is this one. Um, and then I can give you an example of Moonshine for the Thompson group. Here's the example. If I let f of tau denote the unique weakly homomorphic modular form of weight three halves uh, that transforms nicely under gamma naught four and lives in the Conan plus space that has this Fourier expansion, then here's the theorem. It says that there exists an infinite dimensional Thomson module whose greater dimension is six times f of tau in each of whose Mackay Thomson series is a distinguished function of the upper half plane. But basically, this is saying the same story that I just told you about the monster group and the convict group is also true for the Thompson group. Um, and by distinguished function, I mean that each of these functions is uniquely determined up to a cusp form by its behavior at the cusps. Okay, so that is Moonshine or the Thompson group. That is the theorem that again appears in my dissertation. And at this point, I'm going to pause. I am going to ask because there's a whole I have like a lot of slides on applications to number theory. I can get into them or I can stop here. However, you guys want to proceed because I don't know what time you stop. Um, uh, you still have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going to give you some applications to algebraic curves. Okay, awesome. But I do want to pause here again to ask if there are any questions. So now I'm done with my moonshine story. Now I'm going to tell you elliptic curves. I, I'm, I'm more interested in looking at the elliptic curves. Yep. Okay, great. So here's what an elliptic curve is. So an elliptic curve is a smooth projective curve given by an e equation of over Q. It's the smooth projective curve given by an equation of this form, y squared equals xq plus ax plus b, such that its discriminant is non-zero. Okay, and here's some pictures. Here's an elliptic curve xq minus x. Um, the discriminant here is not zero. You can, this is a picture. This is another picture of an elliptic curve. I'm also going to give you pictures of not elliptic curves. So things where the discriminant is zero, what goes wrong? You get either something like this or you get a cusp. So these are these are uh, equations of this, this form that don't form elliptic, 
excuse me, don't form elliptic curves. Okay, so this is what an elliptic curve is. Why are people interested in elliptic curves? Well, um, if I let E be an elliptic curve defined over Q and let EQ denote the set of Q rational points on E. So by which I mean points on this curve whose both coordinates are rational numbers. Um, then actually this set has a group structure. So in fact, Mordell proved that this set is, um, is a finitely generated abelian group. So the way that finitely generated abelian groups work is that you have a finite group, which is the torsion part, and then you have R copies of Z, where R is some non-negative number. R could be zero, but it also could be positive. And in general, finding the rank of a general elliptic curve is a hard problem in number theory. So you can do, so elliptic curves are interesting because you can write the set of Q rational points on any curve that you want. But a priori, uh, most other curves either like automatically have zero points or infinite points. Like I, again, that's faulting theorem. I won't get into the details, but elliptic curves are interesting because they are the only example where all three things, zero points, a finite number of points that is not zero and an infinite number of points is possible. So you would think, well, maybe it's easy to like find how many points, but it's not. In fact, it is a hard enough problem that if you solve it, you would get a million dollars. So it is the millennial prize problem, which is the burton swinerton dyer conjecture, which says that the rank of an elliptic curve, this number r, is equal to the order of vanishing of the fu L function at s equals one. Okay, so this, again, not gonna go into details of the conjecture, but just by the fact that this is an open problem, you should know that this is a hard problem. Okay, at this point, I've just told you about a general problem that I've said is hard. So I'm now gonna look at one specific problem and hope that I'm gonna say something interesting about it. So look at this particular elliptic curve. So here's E, um, Y squared equals X cubed plus 864 X minus 432. And for D a negative fundamental discriminant, I'm going to define ED to be the, the quadratic twist of E. ED is Y squared equals all of this. And so if I define ED this way, then ED and E are actually the same elliptic curve if you look at them over the complex numbers, but they're not the same elliptic curves over the rationals. So in fact, I have given you a parameter D that as you change D, you get a family of elliptic curves all naturally related to the original one that you started with. So you can now ask what happens to the rank as I vary in this family. If I know the rank of E, what happens to rank of ED? Okay. And here's some data. This is data that you can compute using some computational algebra software like magma or something. Um, so the data I'm going to restrict to discriminants that are not a square mod 19. Then for D equals negative four, the rank is zero. For D equals negative seven, the rank is zero, so on. Sometimes the rank is two. Here's some numbers. Okay, in order to say, oh, what happened here? Oh, yes. So. Remember f of q from the last, um, from my theorem on Thomson moonshine, f of q is the, is, is the analog of the j function and the Thomson moonshine story. And let c of d denote its q to the negative d coefficient. So q to the negative d, remember d is negative for me. So it's, I'm talking about the positive coefficients here, uh, positive powers here. Then c of d, I just, put the same table as the previous slide here, but now I've added a column. The column has values of C of D in it. And you might notice that I have colored some of these values red. And again, I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna ask you if you can guess why some of these values are red. What is common between the red values that is not common with the black values and so forth and so on. Any guess is fine. There's no way to do this wrong. This is not a test. Uh, I didn't get what is C of D in this whole story regarding to the elliptic curve. So C of D are the coefficients of F of, 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 F of, F of Q. And I have read in the chat, Hanya says that it is uh, the rank of E of D is zero. And that is a very good um, observation. Yes, so whenever these numbers look red, that's when the rank looks like it's zero in this table at least. So that 
is uh, is true. Here's something else that is common between these CFDs, which is not obvious if you look at this just like this. But if you look at CFDs mod 19, so if you divide them by 19, it becomes clearer that these are the numbers where 19 does not divide them. So these are non-zero mod 19. And this is the theorem that I'm going to state on the next slide. I'm going to say that whenever these C of Ds are not zero mod 19, that's when this rank is zero. So yeah, I'm gonna do it slightly more rigorously than that, but that's, that's, the, that's the point here. So let E be an elliptic curve of conductor 19 and let E D denote the, uh, denote the Dth quadratic twist of E where D is as before. Then let D be a fundamental discriminant, negative fundamental discriminant, which satisfies the, uh, the following, that D is not a square mod 19. And let F of Q be this unique weakly homomorphic modular form, which, which has these um, coefficients. And let C of D denote the Q to the negative D coefficient in the Fourier expansion. Then whenever C of D is not zero mod 19, that's when the Mordelva group is finite. Okay, so that's the theorem. And I'm going to do a quick summary of what I've said so far. I have said that computing ranks of elliptic curves is hard, right? Here's a theorem that if you believe this is true, then instead of computing the actual ranks, you can just look at this modular form, you can divide its coefficients by 19. And whenever the coefficient, whenever the division gives you a remainder, you get that the corresponding elliptic curve has rank zero, right? So this is a way of kind of looking at the elliptic curve without looking at the elliptic curve itself, gathering information about the elliptic curve without gathering, without looking at the elliptic curve itself. Again, very reminiscent of moonshine, very reminiscent of this story of like finding out information about the modular, about the moon, about the, about the monster group without ever looking at the monster group itself. At this point, I have said, here's a hard problem. Instead of doing this hard problem, just do this, compute these modular form coefficients. And you might ask, well, is computing the modular form coefficients actually easy or is that also hard? Because if it, that was hard as well, then I've done nothing for you. I've just taken a hard problem and given you a different hard problem. So in my last slide, I just wanna say that actually, Computing the coefficients of this modular form is not hard at all. There's you know, techniques in modular form theory that tell you that these coefficients are just like a finite sum over some values of J function. If you know what traces of singular moduli are, if those words mean anything to you, then these, these numbers are just traces of singular moduli. If you don't know what they are, then believe me that this is just a finite sum over some well-known quantities. Um, and so computing the the, this modular form is not hard. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there and let you ask questions. Um, tell me more about what you want to hear. Ah, wonderful talk. Wonderful talk, Mariam. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very nice presentation. I just want to ask, uh, uh, can you go back to that particular slide where you define the elliptic curve, uh, the group structure? Yes. And the rank problem. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what about the torsion part? Particularly, your whole results are particularly regarding to the torsion part of it. Yeah, very good. Good, uh -huh. good question. So actually, I didn't tell you that um, basically everything is known about the torsion part. There is a theorem that says, you know, there's only 16 possibilities and here's how you compute them. So the torsion part is uh, or the torsion part is, is like less interesting because it was done in like 1920s. So that's a, that's a good question, but like it's, it's it, uh, the, the hard problem is the, is computing the rank. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, how, how the complex numbers and modularity come into this particular business? Uh, I, I feel to pick curves, that part. Yeah. So I didn't, so, so that is not, not obvious at all. That is true moonshine. So, if you believe this theorem, so let's go back. I'll give you some idea. If you believe this theorem, then this theorem, has, what this has done in, in very vague terms, it has said that this group acts on this vector space, W let's say, and the vector space is related to these um, F G of tau's 
These are modular forms. Modular forms in some vague way are also related to elliptic curves, uh, mainly by the modularity theorem. The modularity theorem says, you know, for every elliptic curve, every elliptic curve is modular, by which it means that every for every elliptic curve, the L function is, uh, th there is a modular form that exists, a way to modular form whose, whose L function is the same as the elliptic curves L function. And then the L functions are related to the rank by this, the story of the virgin swinnerton and that conjecture. So this is the problem with like doing an hour long talk is that there's so much background in all of these stories. So like the virgin swinnerton and I can spend a whole like hour telling you about the L uh, function and that story and modularity theorem. But really that's the, so just to give you a, a, a picture, the picture is that you have modular forms which are maybe related to elliptic curves through a modularity theorem. But they are related. Um, so you have one modular form here, one elliptic curve here, one modular form here, one elliptic curve here. And you have elliptic curves that are related to each other by this like twisting stuff. So you can ask, what about these modular forms? So pick two twists, what about their, their corresponding modular forms? Well, the moonshine story takes these modular forms and gives them some structure that they inherit from this Thompson group. So this is basically, I'm translating the structure that this Thompson group is giving to these like, modular forms into the, the structure on elliptic curves. I hope that kind of answers your question. That was very... Yeah, a long route, long route in order yeah, to... Yeah, it is a... Get to... Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, any question from the audience side? So uh, what is this? Uh, is there any moonshine connection with theoretical physics or in string theory? Yeah, yeah there is. I don't know it. So um, <laughs> there's definitely, so what is upper algebras, the, the thing that I keep saying, but not defining. So. So let's see. So let me go back to. Okay, so I just wrote in one sentence that like Borchardt's proved this. The way Borchardt's proved this is that Frankel, Posky, and Muirman actually constructed this, this V and Borchardt's used like the no ghost theorem from string theory. Don't ask me what that is. I just know the name um, to say that this is, this actually works. Um, yeah, so there is a, there is some like really interesting connections to string theory, but I don't know enough string theory to like give you a satisfying answer other than yes, there is a connection. It's out there. I don't know it. Oh, yes, Other Buhari. Questions? Yes, Buhari. Uh, you are muted at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, uh, Mayim. So there is a yes. question which is uh, in the chat box. Why do you insist on rational representation in the definition of Fourier expansion and uh, and its definition? I understand the motivation of for elliptic curves, but we can do things more um, generally, I guess. Whoever asked this question, do you mind unmuting and asking it? Uh, because I don't think I completely understood what the question is. What okay, what do you okay. mean by rational representation? Uh, particularly, uh, I what I can see is that uh, the theory of elliptic curve and the theory of elliptic curve, the major problem is somehow dealing with the uh, finding the rational point. The group structure is on the rational yes. point, right? So I don't understand the Fourier expansion part. Yeah, was there any condition? Was there any condition on rationality there too? I don't think so. I am not. I mean, a lot of these things are integers and rationals, but I, I don't think I completely got that question. Please ask the question and like ask a follow up if you want. I will answer it. I just am having trouble understanding it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I always okay. take representations over rational field. Well, okay, so it depends on what you mean by representations. If you mean like literally representation theory, then that is not true. I actually took representations over, over C. So I, yeah. If you mean Fourier, if you mean uh, elliptic curves, the answer is yes, you can do elliptic curves over C over whatever you want. Um, the reason that we do them over Q is just because we have more, um, there is more known about Q. We have more, um, um, what do you call them? We have more tools over Q. Characters over, okay, you do mean, okay, okay. So you do mean representation theory, characters, okay. So I guess my answer there is just that I am actually taking them all over over C. So remember these were I minus I one and well, those are not rational numbers. I'm actually taking them all over C and I'm just doing them over C because you know that's the algebraically closed field that we have in characteristic zero. Now you can ask about representations and not characteristic zero, but that's a whole other story. Like that's a whole other interesting stu stuff, piadic representations and all of that, but like that's a whole other ball game. Yeah, okay. you know? and, and, uh, and this is the right time to give the connection of uh, elliptic curves and modularity with the Fermat's last theorem too. Yeah, few words so the about. modularity theorem was proven in order to solve Fermat's last theorem. Yeah, so modularity theorem is a, to me, it is a bigger deal almost um, proving that. Um, oh. yeah. Okay, uh, other any other question? Any other question from the audience? Okay, if this is uh, the case, uh, let us thank the speaker once again, Mariam, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, it was a it was a wonderful 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 talk. This is the first talk in which we are receiving the messages that there should be another talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you and, for having me. That was it was really really lovely to be here. Yeah, and uh, I hope uh, we will have other seminars uh, from Mariam in some other time. And uh, uh, Buhari, uh, if you have fixed your mic, then you can ask the question. Yeah, if people want to ask questions or just like chat, I'm here for a while. So. Hello, yeah. hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Did, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 